the definitive works of Aja Lyons and Maple Hayes. Let's give them an official round of applause. <laughs> yes. And at this point, from this point forward, we can show our love through the literary snapping of fingers. Uh, but we want to, um, I just want to give you just a couple of house rules. Um, this show is about in a little over an hour. Um, we are also recording. So for those who were unable to be here, uh, this video will be made available on the school's website. Um, so just keep in mind as you're walking past, just not to walk in front of, um, don't walk this way at all, but <laughs> don't walk in front of the cameras especially. If you have to use the restroom, because if there is no intermission, they're gonna, we're gonna go straight through with all of the words. But if you need to use the restroom, if you could just wait until after the reading of a piece to exit, and the exit is right there. I think that we don't have any guests here tonight, but we do have a guest here. But um, the exit is right there if you need to use the restroom, okay? Um, I think that's all. Just make sure you silence your phone. Um, the title of this showcase tonight is Summer Nights, and we really thank you for being here, and we really hope you enjoy. Practice now. Hey, y'all. My name is Aja Lyons. I'm Mabel Hayes. And welcome to our senior showcase, Summer Nights. Nice. Um, we worked really, really hard on these pieces. Um, we hope you enjoy them as much as we do, and just have a good time in general. Thank you. The Slave's Prayer. Oh, Heavenly Father, bless my black skin. Bless the sun that radiates from within the flesh you stitch together perfectly. Lord, Bless those that hate me for the body I've been gifted. Bless their eyes. Let them see the magic that you have sewn into my muscles. Bless the path chosen for me. The trials and tribulations of this life are not compared to the ethereal beauty of your being in love. But they are rough. The road paved is not one for the weak stomach, but we tread on with the fact that you are with us stored in our hearts and rice in our graves. So bless my black skin, Heavenly Father, prepare me for the journey home. The heart hurts, Assistina. My mind has a longing of comfort, while my thoughts swarm in as butterflies, hiding something in their wings, wanting to seem delicate. They flutter around, and I find it so beautiful. Yet their flying pattern is not smooth. The touch of their bodies tings my fingers, bring them into laughter. My tears turn into a chorus of laughter. The pain embraces me with comfort, squeezing false happiness in the smooth crevices of my heart as it pleases the butterflies. They dress my thoughts up, saying they are beautiful, and I feel like a floating feather, so light and delicate. Feelings settle in my mind, seeming delicate, but they erupt into heinous laughter, stating that I was never beautiful, saying that I never deserved comfort. As they yell in the body of deformed butterflies, they scream negativity down my throat, so sharp, yet smooth. Until your hand caresses my face in a smooth fashion, making my body feel delicate, and my thoughts fly out in butterflies. As your eyes crinkle in laughter, this, this feeling is comfort. It makes the idea of you and I beautiful. I have found that you are beautiful. The way your voice is so silky smooth and engulfs me in a blanket of comfort. It's strange how someone so delicate can turn my frowns into laughter. Holding a power that flips my stomach into butterflies. You and I are butterflies. We come together as beautiful flying on waves of laughter, letting our wings glide in the sleek, smooth night. We are no longer delicate. We are empowered by each other's comfort. The laughter we have shared has made my thoughts smooth, 
sending my mind to a place where delicate butterflies soar on each other's comfort. No longer is my heart feeling hurt, but beautiful. Our love. And as the jazz plays quietly, hold me by my waist as we dance along to the music. Take my hand in yours, whispering sweet melodies in my ear. Kiss me softly on the lips, run your hand down my arm, all the way down to my fingertips. Let us move with each other and sing as the crowd watches us float along. Tell me that you love me, that we'll be together forever. Be my one and only as we finish this last song. Take me to be your beloved as I caress my hand on your cheek. Let the saxophone hum along as we show everyone our love. early on, but in all her caution to make sure I never followed those familial footsteps, she neglected to warn me about you, about the way you breathe, the way you talk, the way you look at me, the way your bottom lip settles behind your front teeth, the way your words drip like honey over my ears. And I know you wouldn't hurt me the way any substance could, not intentionally, but you care about the words that drop from my lips, you smell like home and you taste like the sunset, and you look like everything I could ever and will ever want. Your voice is my lullaby and my alarm clock, the hair on your head home for my hands. Your body and your heart are no strangers to mine. They have become the best of friends over the lifetimes we will share. Your eyes are my playing ground, your soul jumbled up with mine in a tangle that will take eternity to unravel. And when I die, and God asks me if I'm ready to live my next life, I will say yes. I will say yes because I can't wait to fall in love with you over and over and over again until there is nothing left of either of us. Maybe even then. And I know that you are going to break my heart at some point or another. You are going to be the reason for so many sad songs, so many red eyes, so many nights spent sobbing into the nothingness that is my pitch black bedroom. And I know that when the day comes that we are to separate, be it death or any other forms of immortal betrayal, I will always remember the one who made my nights feel like day. The one who felt like summer rain and the smell thereafter. The one who made me feel invincible but held my mortality in their hands. The one that I will be tethered to in every reality. The love of my lives. If you inevitably leave or when the earth comes to claim you as her own once more, leaving me to take care of our home alone with withdrawals of knowing you are no longer with me will hit harder than any cold sweat, than any fevered forehead, than any symptom tact addict. My world will shatter, the soft wrinkles in my withered skin will find a way to fall farther from the bone, no longer wanting to be on my body if it isn't held in your hand. The temple you built in me will crumble and I will spend the remainder of my time trapped in time, praying for the days that we share with you. has led me to be very reminiscent on the years and where they went. I realize now that I spent a lot of my younger years wishing I was older, was skinnier, was something I not, I'm not and never was. Growing up, the world deemed my undeveloped body disgusting and unhealthy, leaving me with an overwhelmingly unstable relationship with my self-image. I also realize that when I look back on my childhood before coming face to face with a quarter-life crisis at this magnitude, I remembered my past with a resounding ache in my chest because of the trauma, the heartbreak, the immortal dents and cracks in the girl raised by bald fists. The past had laid its hand on my hair and kissed me goodnight, continuously filling me with dreams, with broken promises of a better existence than this. But my life wasn't always broken trust and bawling. There were fire roasted hot dogs, s'mores that, taste, that vaguely tasted like charcoal and burnt sticks, welts on battered brown legs caused by bamboo and curious kids. Every summer, my cousins and I would visit my grandparents' trailer in Four Springs, a town no bigger than the map, than the point of a needle on any map. The girls all slept in a sunset bedroom, the walls white, but, but the trim a sweet red color that blended with the evening sun. The boys slept in a baby blue room, the small room equipped with a full bed and an old PlayStation. The rooms were connected by a hallway, the bathroom nestled in the corner between the doors. When entering the trailer itself, you'd be welcomed into the living room, a 
television standing beside the door, and two brown recliners along, the, along with a small couch positioned to face it. Beside the TV was a built-in cabinet hosting a plethora of small ceramic mermaids, a mirror, and a small pillar. So many hot days had been suffered in front of the weathered air conditioner sitting in her window, watching movies we've seen a million times before because she didn't have cable. Sean and Boo Boo, the only boys that went to Mamon Popo's place, always took me under their wings because the girls refused to play. So while they watched rom com for situations way too mature for their minds to comprehend, I played with the boys. Most of, our, most of our time together was spent scouting the woods behind the trailer, looking for nothing in particular. The world was glazed. The colors of this earth, vi earth vibrant and giving. The brush of bamboo, a brush of bamboo sur was surrounding the, the lot, taller than the trailer itself and almost impossible to break. Almost. When it rained, we would run outside and break the bamboo, swatting at each other in horse flies. My grandmother stayed at the house when my grandfather worked, and she would bribe us with the sweets our innocent minds craved. If we stayed outside all day and didn't bother her housework, we would get cookies and ice pops, but if we did, the wrath of all nine circles of hell would fall upon us, and we knew that. So we became best friends with the beauty that is the Mississippi sky. On Monday mornings, though, was the paper route. Each of the kids were split amongst the grandparents. I was normally with my grandfather and the boys, while the girls clung to our grandmother's hips. During the route, we traveled across almost the entire northern hemisphere of Mississippi, delivering magazines that sported dead deer and fish and tackle on the front covers. The route was gruesome, forcing young children to get up and dress before 5.30 a.m. and not seeing the house until almost 10.30 at night, at which point every child was peacefully sleeping. Those days were the most competitive as well. The favorite child got to sit in the front seat and do practically nothing while the other boys had to unpack the magazines while well, the other kids had to unpack the magazines and send them to the one in front. One of the main reasons why I loved riding with the boys was that my grandfather always made sure I sat in the front, in the front seat. But they always made sure to get me back in the, in the next morning with bamboo bruises on soft skin. I remember one summer I came home covered, summer, I came home covered in bruises. They trailed all the way down my arms, my torso, my legs. I even had a budding bruise under my left eye. My mother was absolutely infuriated, infuriated at the condition her daughter had been returned in, and it was evident in her voice as she ranked my grandparents. I, however, was a clumsy girl that spent all of her time with boys that thought of her as one. Every day for those two months, Sean Boo Boo and I walked around Gore Springs, finding sticks, rocks, and anything we could find that was remotely fascinating. We'd have races, and I'd always lose. We'd have contests to see who could make the most fun of the others, and I always won, but they beat me up. Those boys taught me how to fight, how to play football, how to hunt. They practically made me who I am today. That was the last summer we were all together at the trailer in Gore Springs. The next year, Boo Boo stopped coming, then Sean, then the girls. Suddenly, I was almost always alone, which was very odd for me. I had no one to play with, no one to talk to, no one to taunt. I had to pull more weight down the paper route. I had to walk down the street alone. My only friends grew up and left me behind. Gradually, I spent less and less time with my grandparents eventually not coming around at all. Soon thereafter, my grandfather passed away, and I wasn't allowed to go to the funeral because of how young I was. And after that, a lot of information came out in my family and split us in half, so many of us didn't speak until the family made up. But by then, it was too late. It, all, it had already been too long. We didn't know who each other were anymore, and so we became distant, only speaking on impromptu trips accompanied with other plans. I say all of this to get to make one main point. Never be afraid to look back on the positive parts of your childhood with a warm smile and a single tear, especially if you had a rough one. I found it almost therapeutic to search through my mind and find a warm, fuzzy feeling that's been stored in the back and rehash it. What's the scenery? Are there any sense, any feelings? If so, what? So many times, people with traumatizing childhoods associate that time period with gross feelings. But it's okay to be happy and carefree with the, and it's okay to be happy with the carefree and sunflower that is your past self because that self was selfless and true. That self was a snaggletooth smile and bloody knuckles. That self had unruly hair and wild eyes. That self hated letting boys tell her what to do and only respected three men, God, Daddy, and Papa. That self was, was resilient, was a powerhouse, was a normal little girl. Blue boy, I see you staring in the mirror every day, 
pulling your hair up like you do each morning. You look so tired even though you get enough sleep. You poke and prod at your face, frowning at the way you look. You slap on some makeup, making sure no one can see the real you. The you that is completely different from how you present. The you that is yearning to come out even though you can't. You can't be who you are. So what do you do? Go through the motions, the routines, cry, cry some more, and sleep, because this nightmare seems inescapable. I see you, blue boy. I see you. I understand that you feel so disconnected from the person people perceive you to be. I know you want to find yourself. You want to finally be the person that you were always meant to be. And I know it seems so unreachable. I know it seems like this will never end. But waking up, looking in the mirror with a frown, the pooling at your shirt, but one day you will be you. You don't have to be trapped forever, blue boy. One day, blue boy, one day you'll finally be free from a body that doesn't fit. as the waves take me to never land and place me back in your arms, the salt water saturating my curls. Let's go to Antigua and Barbuda, eat roti on Dickinson Bay, find ourselves swimming in the cocoa butter culture that seems to turn the sand pink. And before we come home, let's stop by Elbow Key. As the day blends into the night, our love will be held in silk pillowcases, bonnets, and do-rags containing our dreams and fear of our minds, kissing and getting tangled as we sleep. Find me in the summertime. Let's trade hearts everywhere we go so that one day we can tell our children that the whole world knows of our love. To my first love, even though you hurt me, I'm not mad. Even though the forever was not forever, it's okay. Even though your hands were hungry, I forgive you. I was wrapped up in you, wrapped up in mutual toxicity, wrapped in, in who I wanted us to be. And now, I have unraveled. Black and gray, 
and so we will sit, our breaths coming out in small coughs of death, waiting for the brightness to spill back into our bed basket. looking into mirrors. I was afraid of what monsters could possibly stare back at me, what gremlins, dragons, or ghosts would be haunting the reflective surface. But growing older, I realized that the monster I was scared of wasn't some foolish thing created to scare children with fangs and hand for blood. No. The real, the real creature of the night took its shape as the fat that clung to my arms and legs. It disguised itself as stretch marks and acne scars, big hips and bigger bellies, back fat and breasts. It looked just like me. I was bullied a lot in school. Popular things people tended to talk me for were being biracial, being predominantly friendless, being taught for my age, being ugly, my weight being the most accepted subject among my peers. Many people just couldn't resist the primal urge to draw those imperfect. So middle and high school were filled with playful jabs at my weight, the fear of eating around other students, and being used, to, being used as the center of many cruel pranks amongst friends. Apparently, the only, worth, only thing worse than being fat is loving someone who is. This emotional turmoil led me to avoid looking at myself. Hence, I began to shower with the lights off and I refused to look into mirrors, only doing so when necessary, i.e. when doing my hair or makeup, when popping pimples, etc. But COVID came and with it quarantine, blocking us into our homes with no way to escape our worst demons. I hoped, however, that I would finally conquer my fatness. I put in the time to exercise, to count calories, to check the scale annually. I loved the idea that I was finally losing a burden that had been following me for the better part of 17 years. I thrived knowing that I would soon become conventionally beautiful, conventionally lovable. But the thought of looking into mirrors still brought my heart to my throat and my stomach into a frenzy. I didn't want to know how much I had to lose, it just had to leave. I wanted to forget about the trauma, the jokes, the nights spent trying to wash off in the shower. One night, I was exhausted. I had been out all day with my mother and her crazy antics and rantings, so I decided I deserved a night off. At this point, I had lost almost two inches off my weight and had been adamant about not eating more than a thousand calories. In hindsight, that might have been to blame for my bouts of fatigue. I had also just begun watching an amazing show, Euphoria. In the show, a recurring character named Kat was overweight and kept to the back of the friend group, but she had an epiphany mid-show. She realized, and I quote, my whole life, all I've tried to do is take up less space. Try to hide from guys who might like whisper to the friend under their breath as I walked by. I spent my whole life afraid people would find out that I was fat. But honestly, who cares? There's nothing more powerful than a fat girl. Initially, that, ha that line hadn't affected me. I thought that she was just some poor soul who hadn't been exposed to the ancestral fear of fat women. So I didn't miss the scene. Finishing the show, teary eyed. I kept my routine. Waking up, starving, drinking water, eating, working out, sleeping, then repeating. It wasn't until I rewatched the series that I truly heard what Kat had said. Nothing's more powerful than a fat girl. It was evident in the way that she carried herself, in the way she interacted with others, with herself. She had officially stopped caring, in that the confidence she exuded was glorious, gorgeous. I strived for that same type of beauty. I cried when I truly understood her words. I purged all of the hatred and resentment I held against myself and others. I released it all, giving it willingly to the puddle that I collected on my pillow. The next morning when I woke up, I felt so different. I remember sitting on my bed thinking over and over again about all of the abuse and trauma that I had undergone. I was there for an hour or so, contemplating my own self-hatred and its place of origin. That morning, my head had been, was the clearest it had been in so long. It was hard for me to recognize myself. Up until that point, everything I did was deliberate. I believed that I absolutely had to lose weight or that I wouldn't be happy or beautiful. That epiphany came on May 30th, the day before my 17th birthday. I can recall it so vividly. There was nothing for my family and I to do for quarantine and not been lifted yet, but I felt so light. It felt amazing to look people in their faces in conversation, to see anything other than my gray blessed shoes. It felt nice to be living and not just alive. I began to experiment with my look. I exercised continuously until school began, but even now, I don't feel any better or worse. There's still some parts of me that I would, I would like to improve, but now it's not for the sniffing boys who whisper to their friends when I pass, or for the family members that constantly buy me smaller clothes for when I get skinny. It's for me, and only me.
I don't know. Sunflower. I am the sun's daughter, my bright yellow reminiscent of my mother's fire, the same flame that finds itself present deep in the belly of my beast, the root of my anger and pride. My father is the earth, his base bronze stretching itself over my face, my arms, my back. He is my running ground, his green hands holding me close, afraid that I may run away. But I must, for the other flowers wish to grow without my vibrance. They chase me around the terrain of my father's face, forcing me to seek refu refuge in the brush of his brow as they try to hang me from his nose. My mother keeps me, though, her embers continuously sparking the bed of coal in my soul, setting me aflame every morn, tethering me to this earth in doing so. And that's helped me stay so long. Mother recharging my battery, father giving me ample space for, ra for radiating, for reaching, for running and hiding to fight for another day. Natural remedies. Maple and maple syrup and tea slow down to my esophagus. I get a swallow, but recoil in the disgust of it all. It makes me think of the brittle bark on the beauty outside of here. Perhaps this was her strength to a certain piece of nothingness. She's been laid out for all to see. Ooey, gooey, taken advantage of. No one asked me if she'd be okay after being left completely empty. I float to the depths of her trunk, thanking her for the gift she's bestowed upon humans like us. We just take and take and take. She smiles down upon me, placing warmth into my body, wiping away my sorrowful tears with the unfilled roots, roots of her maple. I nuzzle up to her wooden bosom, feeling the greatest sense of comfort. The salty water clouds my side once again, and I know my love will be taken advantage, advantage of over and over again.
It's complicated. You're at a friend's birthday party and it's late at night. You will make prank phone calls with your friend until you scroll across a name. Xander. You find that it's the most intriguing name you have come across so far. Ask your friend who this guy is and she'll say some guy from camp. Press the call button and muster up your southernest accent. His voice will be deep and out will come a confused hello. Howdy, you will say. We are selling apples of all different colors. He will play along and you will be charmed by his sense of humor. Your friend and you will roll over on the bed laughing. The phone call will end and the two of you will text him. She's suddenly interested in said guy from camp. But why, why now? It's because she sees the hunger in your eye for love. You have to be noticed and might possibly die if he does not take an interest in you. So, what happens when two people want a singular guy? War. War happens. You two go back and forth, complimenting him on his poetry he decided to share about his ex. This is so powerful, and I can see the hurt in your words. You text back rapidly. Your friend snatches the phone and writes a simple, that's good. You have the upper hand now. Text back, I'm a writer too. I like writing poetry. He will be intrigued, and your friend will fade into the background. He sends a picture of himself. Nice. You find him attractive. He's white, straight, brown eyes, brown hair, everything you think you want. You have to send a picture of yourself now. Quick, choose the photo you recently took on Snapchat. Send it before he loses interest in you. You're cute, he types in response. Score, 100 points are given to you while your friend is at a negative zero. You got this in the bag. Your friend doesn't even want to send him a picture. Hurry, send him your personal number. No reply, he's asleep, you assume. It's the morning time and you grab your phone immediately. Could this be the moment? The one time that a guy actually wants you to be his? Hey, sorry, I was asleep, the message said. Oh, that's fine, I was just giving you my number so me and my friend didn't have to keep sharing the phone, lol. Make it lighthearted, it's all good. He will send you more of his stories, ones that he sends everyone else. You will put your heart into these pieces of writing. Wow, that was truly fantastic. You have such a way with words. He will ask to see some of your writing. You will put something together quickly. It will be absolute elementary work, but you're just 13 and he's 16. So surely you will understand. It will just take some time to improve. He will reply to your poem with a generic response and you will swoon at it. He's got you wrapped around his fingers so tightly that you can't even use your brain. It's September of 2016 and you guys text every single day. Anything he says is magical. He will make the move, text you on Snapchat, and you will open it. I like you, he will type. You will ask if this is a prank, and he will say no. You will reply, I like you too, Xander. You two will bask in the thought of reciprocated feelings. It will be lovely, and you guys will text even more. He will say things like, you have the heart of a Disney princess. You'll fall over dead. Just kidding, you'll write back a cheesy response. You are the light in my darkness. You are the light of my life. It will go on and on and on until you make your Snapchat story viewers gag their hearts out. It's November and you're having the worst year of your life. Your mom is trying to get custody of you and your dad is preventing it from happening. You will go to court countless times saying that you want to live with your mom, but you're just a kid so you will be forced to live with your abusive father and will see no hope in life. Until Xander texts you and your heart flutters. Him, he's the reason to stay alive. He will tell you that he loves you and you will feel whole. At least he doesn't think you're useless and will actually listen to what you say. Yet, you won't tell him that you love him. Feel like that saying is used too loosely. After all, your dad says it and then hits you in the head, but He's not your dad, and that makes you think about your feelings. Do you actually love him? Give it a few weeks before you finally decide that you do. Then the saying will be thrown around like an endless game of tennis, and boy, do you love the game. December will roll around, and you will realize it's your birthday month. It won't matter, though, because you see no purpose in celebrating misery. You are still living with your dad, and you have fallen down a dark hole. You can't get out. 
You try to escape, but you always come back to the same destination. Xander will be concerned for you, and you will tell him what is going on. He will try to sound like a hero. He will say that he will save you from your dad. But is that all just a load of buttered up lies? Surely not, because Xander loves you, right? So, you will believe that a 16-year-old boy will take away all of your suffering. You will tell him every time something bad happens, and he will say how much he despises your father. Great! You guys have a common interest. Hate! You hate your father. But, do you know what you hate more? Yourself. So, you will carve patterns into the skin you make, and Xander will not be there to save you from yourself. But wait! There's more! Xander has many more problems than you do, so now you guys will turn into a projectile vomiting pit of toxic waste. You will throw some at him, and he will throw back twice more. Lovely, you two are past the lovey-dovey stage, and now have reached the brink of negativity. There will no longer be room for jokes. Instead, that will be filled with each other's personal problems. Oh, and don't forget the empty I love you's that are supposed to hold together your now therapist-to-therapist -therapist relationship. Some days, you will feel so worn out from hearing his issues that you will give out I'm sorry's like Ellen DeGeneres gives away money. Ah, oh, isn't it so fantastic to be in love? It has been months, and you two are still hanging in there. You are finally able to live with your mother, and it seems like everything will be peaches and cream. Yet, Xander and you still have a ton of problems. Both of your mental states are declining at a rapid pace. It feels like the only time when you two are happy is when you are in each other's arms. Any other time, you are feeling numb, and he is feeling all types of emotions. When you guys see each other, he shows you his love by kissing you sloppily. You go along with it because this is what lovers should do, right? Feels like the most ridiculous thing in the world to you. You wonder why humans make such a big deal out of such a boring event. You try your hardest to get into it, but nothing works. Surely, you must be broken. He started to notice that you don't like that type of physical contact. He wonders what is wrong with him, and you can only say that you were the problem. You have tried everything to enjoy the intimate moments you two share, yet that isn't enough. You start to hate yourself again. You want to feel what he feels. Maybe you are a lesbian? He will dismiss your idea, and you will agree. Anytime that he kisses you, you will pull away shortly, then make a stupid joke. It will be an occurring thing for you to make light of the situation every time. He will stop making that type of contact with you, and you will be upset. Why can't you just be normal? Why are you so difficult? Now he will come to your house, and you guys will watch Netflix. You will prop your legs on his lap and enjoy the show, but he won't. He doesn't want to just sit there watching stupid shows. He wants to wrap you up in his arms. You just want to watch your favorite show with him. That's not enough for him. Maybe you're not good enough for him. Maybe your relationship could be better if you would just enjoy those intimate moments. It's been two years and six months. You just want to have free time without him texting you. Hey, are you there? Yes, you are there. No, you don't want to talk to him right now. You tell him that you still have time. You have to have time for yourself, or you will get irritable. He says he understands, but he still sends texts like that. So you guys work out a plan. You will say that you need alone time, and he will say okay. You tend to say you need alone time too much, though. He doesn't like that. He feels like you don't love him even though you guys text every day. You continuously reassure him, yet he still feels insecure. He will constantly ask, how do you love me? He will rehash, you will rehash the experience you two have been through together. You will say that you care about him, yet that's not enough. Am I just your emotional support animal, he will ask? You will be hurt. Does he really think that low of you? Is it that he doesn't trust you enough? You will never find these things out. Instead, you will say that you are sorry. Sorry that you cannot fulfill his expectations. Sorry that you cannot control your body. And sorry that you are who you are. He tries to dissect you. He wants to understand why you are the way you are. You don't even know who you are. You will ask questions and you will have no answers. You will be honest, but it's still not enough. You will wonder why he can't just leave it alone. He will keep pressing. 
He will ask why you don't kiss him anymore. He will ask why you don't run out to his car and hug him again before he leaves. He will ask why you use jokes to get out of central situations. You've grown tired of these questions. It's a Saturday night in January, and he texts, we need to talk. This response makes you anxious, but you will text him back. He feels like you two have become more like friends. You feel a sense of numbness wash over you. Your brain wants a barrier around your heart. It's telling you to get ready for a harsh landing. He will say he doesn't know how, to, how you two will fix things. He will say that all you guys do is watch Netflix. He will say that you never feel intimate when you guys kiss. Forget about the emotions you feel, because if you don't have those kind of feelings towards him, you're just a good friend. You feel like it's all on you. You're the reason why your relationship is about to be forgotten. He thinks that you guys should take a break. You don't do breaks. You feel like a break is just short of a breakup. You can't be enough for him, so why should you be the dead horse? He will agree, and you guys will have mutually broken up. The numbness will fade away by the time the conversation ends. Your face will turn into a sea of liquid. It will feel like you are being attacked. Knives will step holes into your heart. When you rehash memories of him, the knives will dig deeper into your heart. You will be sitting in class, think of him and cry. You will cry because you still love him. You will cry because you still care about him. You will cry because even though you tried to show him how much you loved him, he never felt the power of it. So you will stay quiet and delve into poetry. It will be about love, breakups, and you will stop reading. You will close yourself off to love and hate the idea of it. A week later, he will drop by your house to give you your stuff back. You guys will exchange each other's promise rings. You will give him back his Mary Lou books. You will give him back his jacket. He will give you the two parts of the yin yang necklace. He will look you in your eyes and say that he would rather you keep them. You two will sit in the car reminiscing about the times you had together, how you guys would make the stupidest jokes at Sonic when you get dance together in the yard during Christmas time. Then he will put his head on the steering wheel. You will try to cheer him up, but he will say that he never should have mentioned it. He will say that he will go to therapy, that he will do better. You will wipe away his tears and say that the breakup was needed for the better. After a couple hours, you will step out of the car, hold each other tightly, and he will drive away. You will walk into your house with a hole in your chest. Your mom will be there, and she will hold you while you sob into her shoulder. He will get a new partner a couple weeks later. She will have the same features as you, brown hair, bangs, slim thick. You and him will still be talking, and he will say how much he likes this girl. You will be pissed off at him, but it will say that you want him to do whatever makes him happy. Then you will realize that you still have those feelings for him, and so you will block him on all social media. You will make a pact to find out who you are as a person. You will say to yourself that you will find love for who you are. Months will go by until April comes around. You will still check his social media to see if he's okay, but you have dis begun discovering who you are. One night, you will be searching up the word asexuality, and it will make sense to you, and you will identify with it. You will not feel broken anymore, but empowered. This word will give you a piece of why you are the way that you are. In May, you will meet the people who will encourage you to come out of your shell. They will accept who you are, then you will look in the mirror one day and smile. You will smile because you're an independent, panromantic, asexual person. You will smile because you have come so far. You will smile because you will realize that the past breakup has encouraged you to find a part of yourself that you had been missing for a long time. In August, you will start wearing clothes for yourself. You will wear what makes you feel good inside. You will cut your hair and answer to no one why you did it. You will find beauty in everyday life. You will be open to the thought of loving someone again. You will not be thinking about your ex anymore. You will look back and see a person struggling with a great deal. You will see their triumphs. You will see their self-discovery. Then you will realize that they are you. All of these past experiences have molded you into who you are today. You are strong, you are a work in progress, but most of all, you are an overcomer. For that, I am proud of you.
1999 Columbine High School, Littleton, Colorado. Blake remembers this day perfectly. She remembers how the weather was an unnaturally warm, even for late spring, how the sky was clear, the electric blue of the atmosphere peeking through the gaps in the ivory tufts of cloud, how she had been sitting on the bench closest to the door listening to a mixture of Britney Spears, Nirvana, and Carlos Sotana on her MP3 player. The first part of the day had been a log one, which typically happened when even the trees seemed bored. But Blake knew that that day would be different. The sun refused to move, subjecting those on the face of the planet to farmer's tans and back sweat. Blake enjoyed it, though. She felt at peace. The heat turned her face to slight shades of pink. In the distance, people talked and whistles blew. Blake smiled, the scenery bringing her a sense of ease. Blake had a hard childhood. Solitude and loneliness bring, being her only friends. Her mother had been an alcoholic, her father an irritable addict, so she learned the art of silence at a young age. She spent a majority of her school years in the back of her class, trying to be as quiet as possible, afraid to talk to the students around her. But in the eighth grade, a teacher showed up to her door, unannounced, to speak with her parents about her grades. Blake opened the door, terrified, and watched as her teacher shot more sympathetic looks her way. The next week, CPS had come to talk to her, and weeks after that, she moved to a new home with new parents. The summer before freshman year, she met her best friend, Natalie, Natalie Miller. They knew immediately they were going to be best friends, so at the first chance they got, they exchanged phone numbers and talked nightly. Despite practically being her other half, Natalie was the absolute opposite of Blake. She had strawberry blonde hair, speckled skin, and love for all things yellow. She came from a loving, healthy family that had more than enough money. She was very outgoing and had been since the day she was born and hated going outdoors. Sean Hunter needs me more than Mother Nature does, <laughs> she would say. She loved Freddie Prinze Jr., Skeet Ultridge, and although Johnny Depp was totally not her type, he's literally so hot. Most of her allowance went to about 17, or teen, or teen B. She was chair from clueless in the flesh, and everyone loved that about her. She always sat at a table at lunch. People loved hearing her talk. She tried her best to be as nice as possible to anyone and everything. Her mother and father were always there to support her, and when Blake came into the picture, they supported her too. They did their best, giving their daughter the best life she could possibly have. The second bell rang, pulling her from her trance. She sat up, looking for the familiar blur of rose gold. Before she knew it, Natalie appeared from underneath the, black, the top of a black Ford Mustang. On this particular day, Natalie had opted a white shirt for a white shirt, a strawberry print skirt, and white jelly heels. Blake, on the other hand, wore a plaid skirt, a black shirt, and black combat boots. Blake smiled, waiting for a friend to notice her, and when she did, they embraced in a short yet sincere hug. Okay, so I was on the phone with Michael last night, and like, get this. <laughs> Which one's Michael again? Blake quit. Natalie shot her playful glare, continuing. He wants to get dinner this weekend. Like, Michael Schaefer wants to go out with me. Isn't that literally perfect? I mean, he's not that cute, Matt. Ugh, oh, that is it. He's literally all that, a bag of chips, and a pop. You're literally but. How could you not see it? He looks like Michelle Pfeiffer if she were a dude. I don't understand your taste in men, Blake said, with a smile playing at her lips. Natalie retorted laughing. That's because all the guys you like are sissies. Blake pushed her arm gently, force, feigning offense to Natalie's words. They continued their banter on throughout first block, quieting down only when the teacher began to speak. Second period had gone on a blur, polymatic items and BS. When the bell rang, Blake and Natalie made their way to the cafeteria as soon as possible. They found a secluded table to eat at, close to the window, so Natalie could get some R&R -R while in hell. While eating, Blake pricked up. Oh wait, I almost forgot. She dug into her black book bag and pulled out a white bucket hat, complete with an embroidered power puff curl in front. Oh my god, where did you think this from? Natalie asked, excited. I got two of them. Mine is black and it has buttercup on it. Yours is white with blossom. They fit her personalities, you know? Natalie Bean. She got up and almost strangled Blake in a hug. Blake gasped for air, surprised by the brute force of her small friend. Jeez, dude, chill, she laughed. Natalie flashed Blake a smile and placed the hat on her head. How does it look? Asked Natalie. You look cute. 
Blake replied, pleased with herself. Natalie and Blake finished the lunch, sitting there gushing about hot boys, new shoes, and the I'm gonna be so in love with this hat. I'm gonna have to bury me in it. Bury me in it. <laughs> then in a flash, the moment turned. Eric and David walked into the cafeteria and started airing rounds, sweeping from left to right. She remembers getting under the table with Natalie and staring down the barrel of a gun, and the scream of agony when Natalie shifted toward the bullet for her. She remembers the weight of Natalie on top of her, her lifeless body getting heavier and heavier by the second. She remembers the terrorized shrieks of fear from the voices of the lunchroom, then the hallway, then above them. She knew she should have gotten up and ran away like the rest of the survivors, but she couldn't leave Natalie and she couldn't carry her. So she stayed under the table, Natalie's once white shirt and hat now stained red. Blake's black, black guard now wet from tears and blood. And she remembers being found among the dead, being escorted out of the crime scene and holding a scarlet headgear in her hands as Natalie was wheeled away in a body bag. Blake now sits in her car, staring at the memorial on campus that she attended 21 years prior. Cursing her lap is her only daughter, a toddler by the name of Natalie. When tears, with tears silently streaming down her face, she opened the door, got both of them out of the car, and then started to trek to, trek to living the worst day of her life, the day she lost her best friend. party trip. Breathe whispers down my throat, trail your fingers up my spine, grasp at my insecurities like gold just because you think I'm yours. Claim me as your broken dolly, the one you need to keep safe. Growl at the, growl at the passerbys viciously hold, while holding my limp form. Don't you see what you're doing? Before I was filled with life, but now I try to survive from you. I can't act perfect anymore. You call it protective, honey. I call it control issues. You call me delusional. I call it gaslighting. I'm done. Done with the toxic ways that, that you cover up in false smiles, gifts, and compliments. Your name strikes disgust in those around you. You are the art of dying to those that have already passed. You are not gentle, nor sweet, nor beautiful. You feast on the fresh meat and the decayed car carcass of your dreams. You search the skyline for a place to rest your weary head and heavy body, hollow wings only able to carry so much death. Your voice, sweet reaper, is a song of sorrow. Your melodious screech carries the lost souls of the slaughtered wilderness to eternity. You are a product of necessity, a product of the fittest survived. You are the best evolutionary solution known to man. And yet, you are hated. Why? up, then down, a mix of acrylic and ink brushed in midnight and bright swirls of white. 
Its curves form a demon of the night, pointed talons encasing a singular molar tooth. Beady, bloody eyes glare at me, intending to harm, reaching for my throat, gnawing on my pearly perfections. It wants me. It needs me. I'm engulfed by the fangs, so sharp, so jagged, my body failing. The demon cackles, pulling at my teeth until I'm left gasping for words, speechless. The tooth fairy smiles, perfect teeth shining. Father, safety and comfort. I remember going on walks on the beach, me on your shoulders, my small hands grasping onto your dark brown hair so as not to fall off. You said you had me. The bike rides where you would go so slow so I could keep up with you on my little blue and pink bicycle just so I wouldn't feel embarrassed. You make me feel safe and comforted. Love and laughter. My hand grasped yours as we walked down the bridge right across from Pier Park. You told me stories of how grandmother would take all the kids here ever since they were young. You told me that I am beautiful, how proud you are, how much you love me. I love you too. Thank you for making me laugh. Confusion and lies. Your warm presence slowly turned into me running to my room when I heard the doorknob turn. Your conversations transformed into a red screaming face. Mom became a subject I tiptoed around, but you love to butcher. I'm so confused about what happened to us, what happened to you. It seems all that is left in your mouth is lies. Abuse and self-hate. As the days went on in the house, I felt like I was my only comfort, save my stuffed animals I hugged while I hid away in the closet from you. You spoke of me like I was the most wretched thing you'd ever seen, and not too long after, I started believing I was. What did I do to deserve your abuse? I wish I'd never began hating myself. Now I'm addicted. Disconnection and anger. I finally had gotten away from you, but the memories stayed. They were played in my mind, and I woke up in sweat far too many times. I had shoved all my feelings deep within me when I lived with you, I didn't realize they would bubble over, ruining so many relationships. We may be disconnected, but you gifted me your anger. Hurt and numbness. Behind the anger lay pain sewed into my heart. I just wanted you to love me, and maybe you did. You just didn't know the right way to show it. I used to cry every day about you, wondering why you hurt me, but now all I feel is numbness. Recovery and longing. It took me years to get where I am now, where I actually think I look nice and don't want to punish myself for making a mistake. Trust me, I have not forgotten, and the scars are still there, but for once in a long time, I feel happy. I am recovering, but I still long for that kid who is innocent. The day I began writing this piece, we the seniors started sobbing inconsolably in the middle of a discussion that had nothing to do with our departure, but we all felt the heaviness hit us at the exact same time. And so we cried. Afraid of the future, scared of leaving our concrete jungle so soon, but so eager to graduate and get this over with. Now our time has come. Our last rites as students of MSA have been spoken, and as they lower the lid on the casket of living marks spoken to the cracks in our faded roof and splintered floors, I have one more hymn to sing before I leave you all for the last time. To the strawberry blonde with an affinity to 80 synth pop and coffee the color of each other. To the blushing boy with hands warm enough to heat the earth. To my only president, the one that never learned how to not love fully. To the state champ that has stolen the hearts of America twice over. To the embodiment of Mother Nature and cocoa butter. To the Edward Allan Poe enthusiast with a hot chocolate addiction. 
to my soul's counterpoint in the body of Aphrodite and to the woman with the mother's smile that instantly makes any room feel like home. I am and will forever be thankful for the time we spent together. For the night spent eating watermelon on dirty skylines. For the endless days procrastinating. For the, for the inside jokes, the screams of excitement, the tears of true heartache, and, un, un, and the unconditional support. Thank you for everything. I've never felt more loved than I have with my favorite group of eight, and I want each and every one of you to know that I love you all just the same. From the first day we shared the literary, literary lab, where nervous laughter and infectious smiles littered the room, I have seen every single one of you flourish into strong and talented individuals that have learned what it is like to sacrifice, sacrifice sleep for forgotten deadlines and confusing grades. You guys have become a family to me, a safety net of people ready to defend my name, even if no one else on campus can pronounce and or spell it. And so now, now that our last year is coming to, to an end, while we try to go closer and closer to the dread that is the real world, I want to take this opportunity to say that no matter where we go, no matter who we are, and no matter who we grow to be, I love and appreciate every, each and every one of you more than you could ever imagine. Thank you.